All right, we will get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Wilson, and I serve as the Associate Director of Master's Career Development and Industry Engagement at the Career Center. Uh, today, we are kicking off our first workshop, Careers in Teaching at the Community College, which is part of the Graduate Career Strategy Series, a five-part workshop in spring quarter for UCSD master's and PhD students. Today, we will hear from Dr. Josh Franco, PhD, an associate professor at Kiwamaka College in East, uh, East County, San Diego. He is a first-generation college graduate uh, introducing political science to the next generation of leaders and scholars is his mission. He earned his PhD and his master's in political science and his bachelor's in public policy from UC Merced. Josh also holds um, an AA degree in economics and political science from Cerritos College. Prior to his academic career, Josh has five years of professional public policy experience working in the California State Capitol and US Congress. Um, today, you will have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Franco about what it's like to teach at the community college level, from understanding the application cycle to building your application materials, including personal statement and teaching statement, to networking with community college leadership and understanding the interview process as a whole, and key skills and competencies to making yourself a standout applicant. So today's session, as you can see, will be recorded and posted on our Career Center YouTube channel. So if you will, would not like to be recorded, you can turn off your video. Uh, Dr. Franco will be speaking for roughly 25 minutes on this topic um, for and then after that, we will devote the last 25 minutes, uh, plenty of time to Q&A. Uh, the first 15 minutes of the Q&A will be recorded and the last 10 minutes will be uh, turned off uh, for the recording. Uh, so you can ask your questions openly and unscripted. Um, if you do have questions that come up during the presentation, feel free to utilize the chat function and we will get to your questions at the end. So without further ado, it is our, our pleasure and honor to introduce Josh Franco, um, our campus partner, uh, for his presentation. Take it away, Josh. Great. Thank you, Jessica, for that wonderful introduction. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen and individuals. I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, what I'll do is uh, ask a question of the group so you can respond in the chat, and then I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen as well as a link to the uh, presentation so you can follow along or kind of divert as we're talking because I know sometimes it's, uh, you know, how we learn is wanting to engage and uh, have this interactive conversation. So my big question besides how you're doing is uh, what year are you and or what program are you in? Um, so feel free to put, you know, either master's student or PhD student, and then whatever uh, field or discipline uh, is yours. Uh, so feel free to type that in the chat. And I'll see it kind of go crazy on the chat for a little bit because people typically respond pretty quick. <laughs> and then uh, as you're doing that, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, so let's do that. <laughs> So it's uh, coming in. So marine biology, history, uh, education, math, earth science, poli sci, oceanography, biomed, physics, bio, global health, neuroscience, oceanography, public health, bio, physics, biomed, educational leadership, material science and engineering. Excellent. So a, a wide cross section of folks across a variety of disciplines. Um, obviously, I'll be talking a little bit from my discipline's perspective, but just know at the community college level, a lot of the things will apply across disciplines. So let's jump right in. Uh, what I'll do next is I'll post in the chat a link to the presentation so you can have access to it as we're going. And let's head right in. So uh, first, I want to give a shout out to uh, Jessica Wilson, uh, Associate Director at Career Services, and then Jade Guttis, who's the Associate Professor of Anthropology and Archaeology. Uh, at Scripps and at the university. Uh, between the three of us, we've had very uh, thoughtful and interesting conversations, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my experiences with you uh, being in the community college field. 
So a little bit about myself, uh, as you've heard from Jessica, I earned my AA degrees in economics and political science. So I'm a proud first generation community college graduate. I transferred to UC Merced when the campus opened in 2005. Uh, so so a little a little while ago now, <laughs> but I was there on the ground floor as a, a founding student. I deeply appreciated that experience being in the Central Valley and being at UC Merced. Uh, after that, I got an internship and then full-time employment in the state capitol, working for then Lieutenant Governor John Garamendi, a former insurance commissioner and now current congressman, and then went with him to Washington, D.C. for a couple of years. And all in all, five years of experience working for Garamendi was wonderful, and I would encourage you to get not only your academic experience, but also value that professional experience that can come with your fields. Uh, after that, I returned to UC Merced to earn my master's and PhD and was proud again to be a part of the first cohort of PhD students at UC Merced. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, obviously struggled at times. As you guys know, the graduate uh, school experience is real. The struggle is real. Um, so uh, all of an all, got it done and moved on. And then obviously you guys can check out my website for more info. So first thing I'd like to do is open a website and bring it to your attention. It's called CCC Registry, which are jobs at the California Community College. Um, and I'll go ahead and open this link and pop it up for us. <clears throat> and what you'll find here is basically the directory of, uh, of colleges in the system. And then you'll be able to search for jobs in the field. So let me zoom in just a bit so you can see this more closely. And you can create an account, which will allow you to have like a mailing list of information. And what I'll do here is just search for a job. So I'm going to go ahead and take uh, one of the disciplines here. We'll type in physics. So a job posted anytime, we'll type in physics. And say we're looking for faculty positions across any uh, community college district. And let's see what pops up. So here we see 30 different job opportunities. You'll notice that many of them are part-time. Now, my assumption is that you're obviously interested in a full-time position. So I'll point out um, those here, and we'll kind of dig into it a little bit more. But you'll see here that it'll tell you the job posting, the district, college, and or city it's located in, the type of job, which should be faculty, and then salary will depend on your uh, experience and or some hourly rate. So here you can just scroll through to see what opportunities there are at the part-time level. And what we're looking for is to find a full-time position uh, that might be available in this field. So for example, it looks like there's a temporary position uh, probably a one-year appointment to fill a you know a faculty member who's gone on leave or maybe a uh, an unexpected retirement and that pay range is anywhere from sixty three thousand to one hundred twenty four thousand depending on your uh, experience. Uh, and if we keep going to our third page, <clears throat> here we see there's another um, part-time position around seventy to one hundred thousand dollars in Marin County up north, and then here it looks to be a full-time position. This in physics and astronomy at Ventura County Community College, which is in Camarillo, a little bit north of Los Angeles, anywhere from 58,000 to 120,000. And then one of the latest positions is a physics astronomy position in Barstow, which ranges from 61,000 to 103,000. And then another one just up north of us in Highway 15 and then in, into the Inland Empire at Mount San uh, Antonio College or Mount Sac College in Walnut. And there you see we have like three or four full-time positions available in the field. This is common in most of the disciplines. You'll see anywhere from uh, anywhere from maybe two to 10, maybe even 20, depending on the discipline. Typically, English and math have a lots of full-time positions that are opened up every year um, in any given uh, job cycle. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about this market and this labor market, where the demand is typically five to 20, and then the supply can be anywhere from quadruple, tripled, quintuple that because a lot of people will apply to uh, into these positions. So it just gets you started with like the database of job opportunities. Next thing I'd like to point out are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you just need to have in order to be at a community college. So on the knowledge level, you need to have expertise in your discipline at the master's or doctoral level. Uh, you need to embrace diversity, inclusion, equity, anti-racism, and accessibility. So while we know there's these broad debates happening across the country, we know that some states are clamping down on DEIA. Uh, we know some places are even going backwards and trying to talk about how things were but really weren't because they want to ignore the past. And here in California, that is not the case. Uh, and we are trending in the other direction, which means we are embracing diversity, inclusion, equity anti-racism and accessibility. Um, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A. 
Next is you have to have a knowledge of shared governance, which is basically how faculty, staff, administration, and the governing board of community colleges work together in order to create policies and in order to implement those policies, knowing that faculty have primacy over the um, academic domain and in the classroom. In California, we call it uh, obviously academic freedom, and we operationalize it at the community colleges as what we call 10 plus one, which is there's these literally 10 delineated items that faculty are responsible for, plus this additional responsibility. And included in that is our uh, primacy in the academic space, in the classroom space, basically having and exercising our freedom and teaching how and the ways we'd like. Uh, lastly, for knowledge is having culturally responsive pedagogy and androgyny. This basically means that you're not only knowing how people or children and or adults learn, you also know how to be culturally responsive to the vast diversity that the community colleges offer. Uh, as you know, the UCs are our premier flagship institution, uh, research institution in the state. Our CSUs are our state schools, uh, which do both a mix of teaching and research, and the community colleges are exclusively on teaching. But the difference is that at the community college, we take everybody, right? There is no application that uh, is used to evaluate your merit, your experiences, your background, and then say you're admitted to the university. Uh, at the college, you walk through the door, and if you're, if you're a minor, you have to have a parent signature or guardian signature. But if you're an adult, we don't ask, you know, we'll ask you if you went to high school, if you graduated, what your background is, but we're not going to say you can't come here because you don't have something. We take everybody. And what that means is you got to be ready to teach the entire distribution of people who have a different knowledge, skills, abilities, backgrounds, experiences, language abilities. Uh, they might have some learning uh, impairments or disabilities, basically everybody. And um, for those of us at a UC, you're like used to working with like the best because you guys are the best in your fields. You're the working with the best professors, research professors in your areas. And when you go to community college, you're working with the best that California has to offer because it's everything California has to offer. So I just want to impress that upon you that being culturally responsive means being able to communicate, engage, dynamically interact and support students from all these different backgrounds. Skills, time management, interpersonal communication, group communication are critical, especially the ability to teach online uh, and to help students learn online. This is was important to us before the pandemic and has become even more important to us after the pandemic, particularly given students' express growing preference to have some mix of online and face-to-face -face, uh, uh, courses every semester. And then lastly for abilities is being consistently collegial, embodying DIEA, communicating clearly, and being able to partner and teamwork with others. And I want to emphasize the collegiality here. <clears throat> You know, you guys have seen, I'm sure, or you've heard from your uh, uh, advisors, you know, how sometimes this faculty might be a little mean, or they've said something upsetting, or some people kind of have an attitude, or they have a an, an air of arrogance, you might have heard. And one thing that's important at the community college is like, we might have bits and pieces of that here and there. But what really makes us different is that we are always centered on the student, because we have a focused mission on teaching and helping facilitate the learning of our students. And what that requires is maintaining consistent collegiality that's always centering. How is this helping the student? How is this improving the student experience? How is this helping them in the classroom, uh, outside of the classroom, beyond the classroom? Um, and the only way to do that in a, in a community college setting is being collegial, being respectful, being engaging. Obviously, you're going to have disagreements. Obviously, you're going to have some personality differences. Obviously, there's going to be some conflicts, but your ability to kind of turn that around and not let it wear you down or wear down others or move past that faculty space into a student or, or, or um, learning space is critical. So I just want to emphasize that. Uh, next, I just like to point out to you, there's this um, resource from the American Association for Community Colleges, and this is Competencies for Community College Leaders. And this was designed with uh, input a whole bunch of stakeholders uh, across community colleges in the country. And it helps gives you a path of like, we you know, what do faculty need to have? What do uh, mid-level managers need to have? What do administrators need to have? And I mentioned that here because typically it's a potential career path for you. Once you come into the community colleges, it's not like there's, you know, 10 of them in the state. There's 115 of them, and they all have their uh, administrative bureaucracies. They all have their uh, laws, rules, and regulations that they have to implement. 
And for those of you who, all of us who interest faculty, there's always the opportunity to consider moving into a non-faculty role, either a quasi-administrative role or a full administrative role, or to eventually go down that track for the remainder of your career. And I just point out this resource to you because um, it was brought to my attention by my one of my mentors, Dr. Juliana Brown, uh, or Juliana Barnes, and um, you know she shared it with me, saying, you know, you should just read this and think about it. You know, if the day may come where you want to pursue a kind of an administrative role and it helps break down those competencies that you need for each part of our community college system. So in other words, we're not trying to like hide what it means to be a provost or a dean here. Like we want to make it super clear to everyone in our system or people who are entering the system that there are pathways for you. And here's the things that we expect uh, from you if you're going to go down those paths. Next are what we call minimum qualifications and desired qualifications. These are the things you will typically see in a job posting for a full-time or a part-time position. Minimum qualifications are defined by the state of California and the California uh, Systems Chancellor's Office. And it's basically, you have to have a master's level in your field and or a bachelor's in your field and then a master's in some related field and or an equivalent. So I just wanna point out here that you don't, typically need a PhD or doctorate, uh, doctoral degree to teach at a community college. What this means is that as you're going through your program and you have that opportunity to, what I say, you know, pick up your master's along the way, do it. Because if you have your master's and then you're in that middle world of finished, you finished the qualifyings and now you're in your preparing for your dissertation phase and then you're getting in your, and you're, you're in your dissertation phase. If you have that master's after your name, it allows you to teach without having to request equivalency if you apply, say, for a part one part-time position at a neighboring community colleges uh, in the area. Um, so pay the fee for the master's paperwork, pick it up, have it in your, put the feather in your cap, go through this commencement, even though you're like, oh, I don't want to pay for one gown and the other. Just do it. It's a lot of fun. It, it's honoring your work. It's helping bring your family along. Um, and it helps motivate you to say, I got to finish to get the, the funny hat. Uh, so I can go and get my doctoral degree. But my point is, um, pick up the master's along the way. Now, for some desired qualifications, uh, and these are typical across the state, they want experience teaching at the CC level, whether that's part-timing or full-timing, it's really helpful. So this is where you need to think about how do I spend some of my time after I say your qualifying exams in your, in your post-master work slash in your dissertation mode where you can fit one or two classes. Now, if you're already an instructor of record at your university, that, should, that will count too. But they, colleges, community colleges do like to see that you have experience in their classrooms because they teach everyone um, in their classrooms. Uh, next is a commitment to maintain uh, up-to-date knowledge in the discipline. So this is where you demonstrating activity in a regional association, a national association are important. Uh, willingness to teach a wide variety of courses. So most disciplines have several introductory courses. For example, in political science, we have now seven introductory courses ranging from American government, international relations, and comparative politics and political theory, which are our four major subfields to newer ones that are like introduction to research methods, introduction to race and gender um, and California government. And so knowing that your discipline uh, and being able to teach those uh, wide variety of introductory courses is, a, is definitely a skill to have. So for example, if you have an opportunity to TA for a faculty member, which I know most of us do, you know, obviously the upper division ones are fun to do because it's like probably closer to your research field and the students are reading the um, journal articles that you're probably overlapping with a little bit as you're doing your research paper in your graduate level class. I would invite you to consider, you know, TAing for one of those intro level courses, uh, because that gives you that beginning experience on how that, um, how you introduce the discipline to a, a, a wide range of students. Next is best practices in diversity, equity, anti-racism, anti-sexism, inclusion, and accessibility. This is where going to webinars where they're having these um, uh, topics discussed, participating in maybe a learning community or a reading group, um, going to uh, workshops that are offered by your national or, your, or regional associations or by the university system as itself. Anywhere where you can engage further in that topic uh, or in the range of topics and demonstrate a growing a willingness and a competency in those different areas is really important. So look for those opportunities um, uh, on your campus and then in your region and in within your associations. 
Uh, next is working with first generation college students. So community colleges serve the most first generation college students across the country. We're very proud of that mission at being a first generation college student myself. It took my mom 10 years at the community college to finish her degree while she was raising me and my brothers. And just know that um, those first generation, um, uh, that the first generation students, they need help. They need the attention. They need you to be equity minded. They need you to see that they have the ability to be successful, that they have the knowledge to be successful, and that you'll be there to help them with whatever they need help with. Now, obviously, there's some things beyond your control, but you serve not only as like a faculty who's helping them learn a discipline and learn your field. What you're doing is you're almost like an air traffic controller saying, because you're going to get students who come with you about everything. From the from the best case scenarios, like I'm pregnant, I'm going to have a kid in six months to the worst case scenarios where I lost my parent, you're going to have to find a way to want to help them either personal counseling on campus, resources from the county, helping them get hooked up with Medi-Cal if they don't have health insurance yet, connecting them with the health office on your on the college campus, connecting them with another faculty member who might be able to work with them more closely and have those more thoughtful conversations, basically helping them find and leverage the resources on the college campus and, uh, and beyond is really important. So working with first generation is super um, important to us. Uh, serving on shared governance committees, so these are things like a curriculum committee or a budget committee at the university level. You'll have like your uh, CAPRA, like your uh, resource allocation committees. You might have department uh, committees that you can serve on as a graduate student. Uh, your uh, graduate student association will have a leadership and other committees that you can consider the UC student association or its equivalents at the CSU or other systems uh, could also be considered a shared governance committee. The point is find a way to demonstrate that you're willing to engage and work with others to help move the mission of the institution forward. And it doesn't need to be on the chancellor's select committee on building out UC this way or that way, right? It can be as, uh, as straightforward as we're going to have a committee in student affairs that's going to help uh, support our uh, first generation student leaders as they go on move forward. So anything like that, I think is super helpful. Uh, and then lastly, being able to contribute to the overall mission of the college and or university. In your guys' case, being graduate students and being successful is your job, right? That is like your primary focus. For those of you who have the time and the energy to be involved in additional things, I would say, one, be mindful of your time. But two, if you have it and you're doing it, then that's you demonstrating an additional contribution to fulfilling the mission. Okay. <clears throat> So a little bit about the application process. Uh, there's several steps here I'll just point out to you. First is reviewing the job posting. And I'll go ahead and open up a link to an existing job posting in my discipline uh, and just walk you through it uh, relatively kind of quickly just so you get a sense of how it looks. So it'll be posted with the college and with the position and when it starts, uh, they'll say the deadline to file or to submit your application. It'll list the duties and responsibilities. Uh, and then particularly here, you want to see what your specific duties and responsibilities are for this position, a list of minimum qualifications that come from the state guidelines, uh, any eligibility. In this case, it might you need to be fully vaccinated or have a TB test or have a live scan completed, things of that nature. I have the desired qualifications. And here you'll see a, a good list, anywhere from five to 15 things. Uh, it'll list the salary and benefits and mention the union contract, which I'll talk more about in a bit and then the application procedure, and then um, the evaluation procedures. So this is a job posting. I'm sure you guys have seen this when you've applied for a TA ship or a, a graduate student research assistantship, or if you've already had a employment before becoming a graduate student, you've gone through this process. Uh, so it's very similar. The thing here is to focus on are the minimal qualifications and the desired qualifications. And this is, again, why you'd want to have that master's in your feather, the feather in your cap, because you can apply for these part-time positions right away to get some experience under your belt. And then you start to build these desired qualifications, either while you're a graduate student at the university or if you're you know, part-timing for one class at a neighboring community college. Uh, next, you wanna create an application account, uh, uh, account so you can set up your documents and start to upload things that you already have. Uh, you wanna gather those and upload those materials like your CV, your cover letter, 
copies of your transcripts, letters of recommendation, if they're requested to be uploaded, which in many instances they are. So they're not blind letters of recommendation that you don't see. You basically ask your letters of recommender or your recommenders to send you a PDF of the letter and you will upload it. Uh, letters of reference uh, or reference sheet, a statement on teaching a philosophy and a statement on diversity. So I'll highlight uh, three of these things here. First is on the CV. What you want to emphasize is your teaching background and experience. What that means is obviously you're going to have a whole bunch of research accomplishments. You just want to move that down and have it be your teaching stuff up first. So where you've TA'd, where you've been an instructor of record, uh, where you've part-timed, uh, that should be up top. Don't uh, inc include your research stuff. Just don't emphasize it. In other words, it moves it down uh, the CV list. Uh, the second thing on the statement on teaching philosophy, this is where they want to know how you approach the entire distribution of students. They don't say that, but that's what they're looking for. How do you, as a student at the university, as a graduate student, as a PhD level student, how will you engage every student? Not the ones who just got 1600 on their SATs and got the 5.0 GPAs in high school. How are you going to teach the ones who dropped out, went into the service, did their four years, lost a leg? And now they're back in the system trying to get their education. How are you going to help the mom who started community college has half the units she needs to graduate, but her mom got sick and she still had a little one to take care of. And she didn't come back for 15 years. And now she's back here. How are you going to help her? Or the student who got all those high grades and got into UC and their mom and dad told them we can't afford it. How are you going to teach all those students? And obviously, you can develop some general categories, some general approaches, but you also should share some anecdotes or some experiences in that teaching statement to help bring it and make it real for the search committee as they're reading through your materials. Uh, lastly, on the statement of diversity, the community colleges kind of already done this. So if you guys have probably seen some of the articles in, in the higher inside higher ed or the chronicle, like diversity statements, what are these things? And they're kind of new for folks at the research level. At community colleges, we've just expected. It. It's just like, it's just already there. So now they're starting to be maybe more explicit about it. The point is, if they're explicit about it, take your diversity statement and make sure that it speaks to the wide or the entire range of students. If they don't say it, then you need to infuse that in a teaching philosophy or you need to infuse that in your cover letter, which responds to all parts of the um, qualifications that are listed. In other words, uh, statements of diversity, um, are important in our field and they're important that they're not just in one place, right? That throughout they're throughout your application. Uh, fourth is submitting your application before the deadline. I recommend a week before. So don't wait to the last minute, trust yourself, get it done, and then follow up with HR three to five days after just to make sure they got your stuff. Most of the times they'll send a confirmation email, but you just, it's okay to call them and double check. Hi, I'm an applicant for the job posting here. Here's my first and last name. I just want to confirm you got all my things and if there's anything missing and they'll tell you no. Typically, HRs are really good at the community colleges of looking at what you got. And if you're missing something, they'll let you know. But don't rely on them to do your work, right? Which is make sure you have your application complete and then send it in. Fifth, you got to wait because it takes a while. <laughs> Anywhere from 30 to 60 days until you hear back. Um, just because faculty are full-time, they're at their jobs, the deans and the administrators involved are all busy, so it might take them a while to get things through. Okay, so let me um, get through this, and we're almost at our 25-minute mark, so give me about five more minutes. So for the second part of the application process, you'll receive an HR, an email from HR inviting you to an interview with the search committee. When you interview with that search committee, it'll include the dean, the chair of the, par uh, of the program or the department, other discipline faculty, classified staff, maybe a student representative, an HR representative, and an equal employment opportunity representative. So it's going to be a wide cross-section of the college community. They will ask you to do a teaching demonstration. So this might be a workshop for the future, like what is a teaching demo and what does it include? Basically, it's anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. So they just see how you interact with the subject matter and how you interact with the 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 committee as if they were the students in your classroom. So they want to see you in action. Uh, you do well there. You'll get a second interview with the college president and the VP of instruction. What's very unique about community college is that the college presidents make the final decision on the hiring of faculty. So think about, imagine that every faculty met with the chancellor at the university in order to get hired. That doesn't happen. It might happen like in passing, but the chancellor won't make that decision. It's made by the faculty and then maybe the dean weighing in a little bit. And maybe the provost for some reason weighing in a little bit, but not 
the chancellor. At the community college system, the president is the person you meet with in the second and final round, and they will be the person who says yay or nay on you. Uh, so they want to see how you are as a person, as a faculty. They trust that the faculty at the first level know that you know your stuff. So it's a matter, is this person going to be collegial? Is this person going to be a steward of the institution? Is this person going to help fulfill the mission of the community college and serving all of our students? That's some of the questions on their mind. Uh, lastly, you'll get a job offer from the president. They'll call you or, or their designee, typically the vice president of instruction or the equivalent of a provost at the university. And then assuming you accept it, you'll work with HR on official transcripts, your initial column and uh, row placement, your TB test, live scan, and getting all your paperwork ready for you to start in the following semester. So <clears throat> I'd like to end with these two things, and then I'll leave the pay scale and other stuff for another time or during the Q&A. So networking and informational interviews. Best, uh, one thing I'd suggest is reaching out to nearby community college faculty. Uh, if you have support from your graduate advisors, ask them to connect you with colleagues in the area because they know them. Uh, and uh, in either case, you want to send an email introducing yourself and requesting the opportunity to meet and have an informational interview. They take anywhere from a week to two weeks to get back to you, maybe a little bit longer. So be patient. Um, in any case, feel free to follow up maybe two to four weeks after if you haven't heard from them. So you shouldn't feel like rushed to do this. It's just a part of like, I'm reaching out. Let's see who wants to talk with me. Next is attend regional and national association conferences and attend panels or workshops specifically about teaching at community colleges. So for example, the Western Political Science Association has a mini conference for community college faculty. And that's where I got, you know, like that's where I went, I met with people. And then that's where I got like my first opportunity to teach a part-time uh, at the community college. So those are great networking spaces. And then lastly, connect with your career center and ask if they can connect you with alumni and or partners who are CC faculty who are happy to talk with you. And uh, last thing I'd like to point out is this academic year in the life. So uh, I was gonna do the day in the life, but I kind of think we think in quarters or in semesters, or at least I do. So we, our semesters are typically 16 weeks. Um, I think maybe one or two community colleges are on the quarter system, but the rest of us are on the semester system. For, so for you, you guys have to change a little bit, but you might be yearning for a semester system after <laughs> so many quarters. Uh, we have a first eight weeks, second eight week as well. So we can break things down like that if you're interested in teaching classes that are shorter term. Uh, faculty at the community colleges teach five sections per semester. And we uh, and those sections could be anywhere from 35 at the lowest I've seen to up to 50 students. So these are uh, uh, large classes. You have anywhere from zero to two that are online. And you have anywhere from five to three that are face-to-face, -face, depending on your on your district, your contract, and your ability to teach online at the time. Uh, you may be able to teach one or two extra classes per semester for extra compensation. Uh, you're focused on teaching introductory courses, so intros into the various fields of your disciplines. Uh, you get a winter break, and like it's typically a true winter break unless you're teaching a spring break, which is a true spring break unless you're teaching or unless you want to do work in the spring break, which you typically sh shouldn't. And then summer break is a true break. And just know that you don't get a paycheck for one or two months because we are typically 10 month employees. So there'll be a, at least one month where you might not get a paycheck. So you just have to plan around that. Similar to what you do now as a, a TA or GSR with our, you know, our, our academic year appointments, you know, that summertime gets dry. So we got to figure something out. Um, and then lastly, I'll uh, just point out that in the slides, you'll see things about pay scale and, and advancement. In California, faculty are represented by a union. Thank you. And we have contracts, we have salary schedules. And if you have questions, reach out to the union. Um, pay scales range anywhere from seventy dollars to $100,000 for doctoral holding faculty. And these are starting out. Uh, to get to the upper range, you typically need to have you know three to four years of experience. But this is what you're looking at starting off. And your advancement goes up one step per year. This is anywhere from two to $5,000 more per year, depending on the district for a uh, 75 plus uh, teaching experience or more. So in other words, if you teach all 10 classes uh, for this year, you'll move up a step in the following year. Uh, and then with that, I'll go ahead and end there um, and happy to answer any questions or comments that you have. So thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. That was incredibly thorough and uh, getting several comments from students and staff members, how um, informative that was. So thank you so much. Um, can we stop the share of your screen? Yes. Perfect.
So I'm going to first go to the questions in the chat. Um, okay. So there was there was quite a few. So we had some questions about um, working and teaching part time, especially for those with a master's. So can you give any advice or direction <laughs> on that and how you navigated that from did you go full time immediately or, or part time? Yeah, so it's not uncommon to be a part time faculty for one or more semesters before you get a full time position. So I was a part time faculty member for the fall semester of 2018. And luckily, they had a mid year hiring, which isn't too common in the community colleges. What I mean is mid year through the academic year. So I secured full time employment in the spring of 2019. Um, but I did that part time full time part timing for <laughs> for the fall 2018 semester. Um, so I would say it's it's not feel comfortable having and going and teaching one or two classes or more before you be, uh, apply for and or become a full time faculty member at the community college. And um, on that topic, any advice about how to support yourself? Uh, somebody mentioned the the pay for part time is not a lot. Any advice about how to uh, subsidize just having the part time teaching? Yeah, so um, I saw here in the chat that it's something about adjunct positions in California currently pay less than minimum wage. If you look at the entire range of work that you do in time, I would say that's true. If you look strictly at what the hourly rate for your class being in the classroom, it's it's not, right? But obviously, we don't just do things in the classroom. We have to prep our classes. We'll respond to emails, et cetera. So most community colleges would just pay you for that classroom rates anywhere from 50 to $75, depending on your academic rank. And that's going to earn you about $2,500 to maybe $4,500 for that single class. Um, what I would suggest here is partner it with any TA ship and or GSR ship that gives you enough time to spend, I would say, at least six to 10 hours on being a part-time faculty for a single section um, and to do the drive and all the other things that come with it. If you just don't have that 10 hour time frame in the week, then you should really focus on finishing your master's and or your PhD, because that is going to be your saving grace later on. So don't, I wouldn't say don't overextend yourself, consider extending yourself and just see how far that, that leg wants to stretch. And if you feel like it's a little too much, don't push your, don't like listen to your physical therapist. Don't push yourself. We'll get you, you'll get there when you get there. Um, so that's how I would approach that. That's really, really good advice. Um, thank you. Um, another question was from an international student asking about what do visas look like in terms of employment? Any insights into that? And I don't have any insights into that. The one thing I will share as an observation is when I look at the job postings for political science, because I keep my mind on that labor market to help my colleagues who want to come into our space, uh, I've seen it where some of the postings will say we will not support um, uh, applicants who need a visa, um, but I haven't seen that uniformly. So I would say pay close attention to the job posting and see if it mentions it there. If there's an absence of the mention, call the HR department and ask them specifically, Do you, will you support uh, an international faculty member to apply and to go through the visa process once they're hired? Awesome. Good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, there are two questions I'm going to combine together about application uh, process. So what is the difference between letters of rec and letters of reference um, or references, right? And then also, um, can you discuss strengths in the teaching philosophies? Yeah, so um, a letter of recommendation is your typical letter of recommendation. You want it to speak to you as a person, you as a teacher, you as a researcher, if you're getting it from an advisor who you've done research with, and you want them to be able to connect it back to the teaching. Um, so this is where you might need to talk and work with them and even give them some bullet points about how to make that connection. You don't want a letter that says, this person is a wonderful researcher. They're going to do amazing research as if you're sending it off to Harvard, Princeton, or Berkeley, or any other of the flagship research institutions in the state or are, are in the country, our ones, right? The community colleges are not our ones, right? We are teaching institutions. So as long as the letter emphasizes that, you're cool, even if it's coming from your research advisor. Uh, letters of reference is just me making the mistake, including letters of reference. It should just say references. So it might be the name, email, and phone number of the person who they might call in the final round, or maybe in between the first and the second round. Um, 
uh, in the interview process. So that's a I'll, I'll update on the slides, but um, not that. For a teaching statement um, and some strengths to us teaching uh, philosophy is one talking about the you know some pedagogical principles. So for example, at UC Merced we have a teaching. Uh, a center for teaching and learning, and they had a series of workshops for graduate students to attend to learn more about how to how to work with first generation students, how to create a, a better learning experience, how to create a culturally responsive uh, curriculum or a syllabus, and those are the types of things that you'd want to mention in a philosophy. Um, and the key is to operationalize the broad abstract principles that you're writing about. So when you say like diversity and inclusion and equity and culturally responsive, we'll give examples of those. An example of this is how when I worked in the professional space, I had to work with a wide cross section of people and I would make sure I spent time with people who weren't maybe, maybe I spent more time with newer professionals to help them learn our space and our work environment. And that's what I'll do for our community college students. I'll work with the ones who need additional support because that's what equity is. Right. So the point is, take your teaching statement and operationalize those key concepts and stick within the page range. So they might say one to two pages or a number of words. Stick with that. And you always want to emphasize um, uh, the DEIA. Like if you can talk about that, I think that's probably the most important. Thank you. And on that topic, can you discuss how much research still matters in terms of getting hired? Um, and securing a full-time position later on. You, you mentioned teaching comes first, but how much of that research um, counts in the interview and application? <clears throat> um, they will, I would say it counts very little. So this is like where you're having this moment or listening to this uh, webinar, like, wait a minute, all this work I've done for five or seven years, does it matter if I teach at community college? It matters to the extent that your ability to communicate your findings and or to incorporate that into a lesson or to bring that to students in the form of a maybe a new introductory course that introduces them to a new part of your discipline or a newer part of your discipline. Um, but the faculty on the search committee or the search committee itself or the president are going to say, is this person going to make great research? Are they going to get NSF grants? Are they going to publish in the top tier journals? That's not what they're thinking about. And if anything, and you emphasize that, you will be asked about, so what's your job here? Is your job to do research or is your job to teach? Straight up point blank, you'll get asked by a college president if they feel like you're maybe trying, you know, like trying to get in, but you're not really there. You're just trying to find maybe a, a place to land for a couple of years until you can find another position. They're getting wise to it. <laughs> they will ask you straight up. So are you going to research here and then leave? Or are you going to go and be a teacher and help our students for your career. Um, so my point is like, see your, see your research as a way to better communicate and introduce students to your discipline, um, potentially create new opportunities for them uh, in either coursework or co-curricular work or even uh, extracurricular work uh, and see it as a way to stay current in your field so that you can bring that to our students. So I'll give two examples. Um, I was asked point blank by my college president, uh, research or teaching. I said, well, my research will f has fed into my teaching. Here's how, and this is how I would feed it into a new course on research methods, because my discipline has moved to the point where if students don't have this introduced to them here at the first or second year, they are going to run into a buzzsaw. And let me tell you my experience running into the buzzsaw at the university as a transfer student. Okay. And then Apparently she, she didn't, she liked the answer or didn't dissuade her because I eventually got the position, but that's an example. Later on now as a faculty member, I'm settled in. I feel comfortable with my, my learn, my learning experience for my students. Okay. So I apply for the American political science associations program on helping junior or recently tenured faculty publish some of their research. Okay. And I, and now I have that. I just got it a couple of weeks ago and now I'm working on turning my dissertation to a book. Now, is that book going to move me up a step in my community college? No. Is it going to get me hired somewhere else? No. What it's going to do is it lets me maintain that intellectual curiosity that I have as, uh, as a doctoral holding faculty member. And at the same time, I was like, oh, I'm start bringing in some students. I'm going to have a book workshop with some of the premier faculty in our space. I'm bringing in some students. They're just going to sit there and listen. They would never have that experience. 
not even we barely get that at the graduate level at the university you have to like beg to go sit in those meetings you know to like watch your faculty get blasted by five different other experts in the field about why their manuscript isn't good enough imagine having a first or second year student who's the first in their family to go to college to see that i'm like that's lovely so for me that's the kind of spaces or the environments i want to create for my students really good examples thank you um, a few more questions from students in the chat before we will turn uh, off the recording and do off the record questions. Um, so can you discuss students who have a bachelor's degree different than what their master's is in? Does that make them you know, disadvantaged in some way um, in terms of their application? Um, and then a second question to that is, are you seeing for part-time, you know, um, part-time more master's or PhDs? coming into those positions and the same thing for full-time teaching positions, more masters or PhDs, what's the norm now? <clears throat> so the um, what I'm seeing in political science is that there are more PhDs willing to consider a career at a community college or wanting a career at a community college. So one of the reasons I was invited by Jessica is because I have all this experience and background. I share this kind of micro version of it to folks as they come for me left and right. What's it like being here? What's going on? What's happening? How can I get involved? Where, where can I navigate the space? I'm like, here's the stuff you need. So I would say that I'm working hard to at least encourage folks in our field and at the doctoral level to consider and to really embrace that career. And now I'm mentoring students who are coming, who are my students, and now they're like, I want to be a professor. Great. Thank you, Maria. I'm so excited for you. Or thank you, Nancy. Or thank you, Stephen. Like, we're going to get you guys where you want to be. Um, at the part-time level, we typically see master's level faculty. Um, applying for the positions and securing them. Uh, we truly value our master's level faculty at the community colleges. They are, uh, many of them hold full-time tenured positions. Uh, and even though it's changing a bit with the applicant pool and more doctoral level faculty or applicants applying, the master's level faculty are so predominant in the system. Uh, and then lastly, for if you have a different bachelor's compared to your master's, as long as you meet the minimum qualifications. So in that PowerPoint, I have a link to the chancellor's office um, qualifications handbook. There you want to see what discipline and then what is the minimum and then how what's the variations on it. And just know that you can always make an argument for equivalency. And this is where you would talk with the um, uh, HR uh, staff and say, hey, I have this bachelor's and I have this master's. I'm looking at the posting. I read the qualifications handbook. I think I can do it. I just want to make sure with you that I can before I submit an application. And they'll say yes, or they'll say no, or they'll say, let me check with the discipline faculty to see if they would take what you have as equivalent in order to teach uh, here a uh, uh, class with us. And then they'll get back to you. So just you know, do your due diligence there. Awesome. And one clarification, when you were discussing the pay scale, was it 12 months or 10 months? And that's for a 10 month appointment. So for example, I'm at a compensation about 88,000 and I get that dispersed over 11 pay periods and there'll be a 12th pay period where that doesn't happen. So that's a, that's the donut um, for the year. Obviously you gotta work around that and stuff. So yeah, divide that number by 10. You might be an 11 month employee. So you would, the scale would be a little different for you. Um, you'll be like, there'll be two scales. There'll be a 10 month scale and an 11 month scale. Basically the 11th month is to add for that 11th month. Um, but I don't know how the pay is dispersed for the 11 month employees. Cause I'm not one. Okay, great. Good and question. Uh, part-time faculty pool application timing. Um, they're typically on a rolling basis. So if you see on CC registry that they are, you know, it says ongoing, feel free to throw your submit an application. I would follow up after you submitted it, uh, you know, check with HR that they got all the stuff and then ask HR if they can check with the discipline faculty to see if there's going to be any openings um, in the coming academic year or the coming semester. And if you don't hear back or they say, well, you know, we don't do that, then reach out to the faculty themselves, particularly the full times because they'll list full time and or part time on their web pages and reach out to them and say, hi, my name is I'm a graduate student here. I have my master's here. I applied to be a part time. I love the opportunity. You know, if I can hear back from you, you know, when you're available, um, I'd appreciate it. And then just kind of go from there. Um, I received those emails probably one probably handful every year where someone says, I want a part-time here and there, and I'll immediately send them to HR if they don't have the application. If they have, then I'll work with my department chair to see if we can interview them. And at the very least, you go through the interview, you can be 
might you might not be offered a position, but you'll be like on the list of people to offer it to if something opens up. So that's where you want to position yourself. Um, the best thing to do is to talk to somebody and you network with them and they really like you and they'll say, hey, you want to come teach a class for me uh, this semester? And then you got something secured. That's awesome. Um, last question we'll we'll use from the chat is resumes. Do they need to be for, formatted CV or traditional uh, industry way? What what would you say for that? I would say your traditional CV. Uh, the key is just to move the teaching experiences up top or the teaching training up top, and then you'll still want to keep your research there because, quite frankly, I think it's helpful, especially for our doctoral students. Like you're hearing like research. I don't want you to walk away saying research doesn't matter. It matters and how you bring it to your introductory students to help stay current, to help keep them current, to help prepare them for transfer to the four year. Now, do you have to go do the day-to-day -day research stuff and experiments and the data collection and all that? No, you don't. Right? That's not, that's not your job, right? That's not your incentive structure at a community college. It's you do that because you want to, and you do that because it creates a better curricular experience for your students. Um, so I would say that, uh, just bring the teaching stuff up top, leave the research stuff there because that's who you are. I mean, like, let's not erase five to eight years of your time uh, in doing this. And I remember when I was going through my process, someone says, well, you know, they don't, I said, I understand that. I said, but I, I, I left a full-time job in government, really happy working in Congress to come do this. I'm not going to take this away because I'm afraid they're going to think I'm a researcher. If they, I'm afraid they think I'm a researcher, then they're going to not select me. And if they, do select me, they're going to, I'm hopefully they ask me about it. And I'll tell them why. Mm -hmm. So I think be honest with yourself, be true, show your true self. Um, and then find that way of communicating how the research will still live on uh, for your students at the community college. That was exactly the advice I was going to say, move the teaching to the top and um, come see myself and Dr. Yasmin yes. Farley on the call it, uh, at the career center. And we'll help you um, get that all sorted out. So I'm going to end the recording, but don't leave.